All right, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each one of you. Each one of you. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be looking again at the parables of Jesus. And I'm going to go back to the main parable uh, that Stanley talked about last week, about the parable and the soils. Just add a little something to that. And we've talked about this, so I'm not saying Stanley did anything wrong. I'm just, he agreed that, let, go ahead and add, add to what he said last week. So, um, and for those who are at home, I'm Pastor David Blackburn. And uh, so we're going to pray, and then we're going to begin. Dear Lord, thank you so much for a beautiful day. Thank you for this week that you've given to us many, many different things with prayer service Sunday night, or uh, Friday night, and, and uh, the men's breakfast yesterday, and Thank you for our service with the elderly people at Grand Reserve this past uh, Saturday evening and uh, ask your continued blessing in that. And thank you for each one here and, and those who may, may come still. We ask you to give us wisdom and insight into your word. Uh, the parables are supposed to be stories to help people understand. And yet, as was mentioned last week, often they obscure um, so that people will come and seek you more fully and uh, find, find the truth. And so we pray that you'll help us in that endeavor this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so for those of you who were here last week, which was most of you uh, that are here today, um, the parable of the sower and the soils from Matthew 13 and uh, from Mark chapter four and from Luke chapter eight. Um, talks about four different kinds of people. And the person, and if you look at the, over here, the soils, there's the roadside soil, the, just lands on the road, and there's no, no depth of anything, and nothing grows. And the birds come and snatch it away. The rocky soil, the thorny soil, and the good soil. Okay, now you'll see a word next to that, to each of them. Um, I'm sorry that Melissa's not here because she likes John MacArthur and David Jeremiah. And, uh, but David Jeremiah used the, these other words for that, that the, the roadside soil is the callous soil. You know, I think of calluses that are hard and, and all. So I think that's a good way of, of putting it. The rocky soil is the casual soil. This is the soil where the, the word is sown and because there's no depth, it springs up quickly. There's certain joy involved, but when the sun comes and scorches it and things happen, they just fall away. There's no, there's no real relationship there that, that has any ongoing meaning. Then the thorny soil, he calls it the crowded soil because this is where when you look at the interpretation, there's like four different kinds of weeds, basically, uh, that, that kind of take out the the seed that has been sown, the, you know, the um, cares of this world, the, um, boy, I should have brought, I should have brought that, this, oh, I did bring it, um, never mind, deceitfulness of riches, anybody remember the other two? Desires for other things, go ahead, don't forget the mic, yes, yeah. So, so the, these are the things that, you know, people will pay more attention to that, to the culture, to what's going on around them, and they say, no, that's, that's not for me. So, and then you have the good soil, the, uh, the converted soil, uh, the one who becomes the true believer and produces 30, 60, and 100 fold. Well, I shared this with Stanley that many years ago, probably in the mid to late 70s. So I was fairly young as a pastor. Uh, I read a guy named Ray Stedman. Don't know if any of you remember of him from California, but he's one of the people I've sometimes used as resources. And, and I remembered whenever I watched Stanley teach last week that he, he did give credence to the idea that these four soils can be in each one of our lives as well. And I know Beverly had suggested that uh, during the discussion time. And so 
with permission from Stanley, he said, go ahead, you can say that. And last night at our Grand Reserve meeting with the elderly folks there, I, I used this, the parable of the sower in the soils with this application that I'm going to give you right now. So if, if you look at this, are there times when your heart is hard towards God? Where it just something doesn't penetrate, whether it's just you're not where you need to be or because of circumstances around you. Um, I think we can have a hard heart as a Christian. In each one of these first three soils, if, if you can see it in your own life, the solution is the same. Recognize it, admit it, repent, <coughs> confess it, and be restored. And it's, it's, it has nothing to do with losing your salvation necessarily. It just, it just has to do with your preparedness of your heart, just like the preparedness of these soils. And so then the other one is uh, rocky, uh, where your things are kind of, uh, you take things like a casual approach. And I, I mentioned last night, you've, you've heard about some people who profess to be Christians. They're, they're a mile wide and an inch deep. They're shallow. They know the salvation message, but they haven't really progressed beyond that. Stanley talked about last week, sanctification. You know, we are to be, from the time that we are converted, we're to be growing in the Lord and being sanctified until we're glorified and when we're with Jesus forever. So, um, again, we, we need to recognize that in our life whenever we are taking a casual approach. Everything is going well, usually in those times. You, you, you like where you are in life and you find you're not reading the Bible as much or maybe you're not praying as much or you know, you're, you're allowing certain things to be more a part of your life that didn't used to be. Um, repent, admit it, recognize it and, and come into a right relationship with God. And then the thorny is the crowded life. You know, you just crowd your life with so many different things. You know, certain things become very important, and the uh, acquiring of things can become very important in your life, whether it's cars or houses or boats or, or whatever it might be, or having more money. And you know what people say when you ask them, how much money do you need? They always say, more. You know, so that we're putting our, putting our focus on other things uh, rather than God. Um, so... So I, I just wanted to, to, to leave that with you as, as something to, to consider as well. As you go through your life, as you go through different times of how you're responsive or not responsive to, to the Lord, whether it's through preaching or teaching or through testimonies or worship time, uh, whatever, whatever means is being used by God to try to help you to grow in your Christian walk, that these could be. Uh, areas that you will also find in your own life. So any, any thoughts on that? Had, have you ever heard that before? Or is that kind of new? Or uh, I, I have to admit, I always took the, the long approach up until I read Ray Stedman and um, kind of stuck with me. And then I saw that there's other people that, that agree with that as well. So, so any other thoughts? Did you put it on, Stanley? Did you put the mic on? Yeah. So it's on all right. You know, it, it's true. If you honestly sit there and okay. think about it, you know, we do go through this. Uh, because, some, you know, sometimes when we sin and we know it's, we shouldn't be doing that and we continue doing it. You and know, justify. Uh, it's, it's that uh, and yeah. more. So we, if we really, really examine ourselves... Right. and really look into what we're doing in comparison to what God wants us to do. Uh, we mess up all the time, and it could be any one of these three grounds above the, the good soil. Right. So we need to be honest with ourselves and with God, and, right. and you know, like you said, confess it, repent, and move forward, and God's going to walk with you again, of course. Amen. Yep. Thanks, Sam. Okay, so the next parable is in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. And it's only found in Mark. In fact, we're going to look at two parables this morning, among four of the parables we're looking at. 
And one's found in Mark only and one's found in Matthew only. So anybody want to read Mark 4, 26 to 29? Okay, you got the mic there. Thank you. Mark 26, 4, 26. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crop by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts the sickle, because the harvest has come. Okay, let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever been farmers? Ever done farming or planting of seeds or... I guess you've done that grass, right? Gardening. Gardening. <laughs> any, the, any of you that can relate to this, the idea of the sowing and stuff? Because I, I don't. See, I, I probably should have looked up more information about the whole process, but I'm not really interested. I hate to say that. My wife is, so maybe I should have talked to her more about it. But I just thought if any of you have, you know, farming background or growing grass or... Uh, <laughs> Can you relate to this? Have you, have you, have you noticed this at any time? That, you know, you, you want to be so attentive to, to, uh, to do what you're supposed to do to make sure you're having whatever it is you're trying to get, grass or, or crops or whatever. And, uh, and sometimes you just realize, hmm, God's working. You know, it's, it's happening. Sometimes it goes the other way, doesn't it? <laughs> I thought that, I kind of had that, saw that look in your face, Karen. And I know from my wife, uh, she's tried on many different vegetables and some success, but some failures as well. But, um, so anyway, the, uh, of course, this is, this is in a parable form. It's trying to teach a truth. And uh, it's talking about the, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's like a man who scatters seeds on the ground. And based on the first parable, the parable of the sower and the soils, uh, we as Christians, you know, it talks about the Son of Man scattering, but also we as Christians scatter the seed. The seed is the Word of God. And so the seed, and it, and it says right in there, the seed is the Word of God. So it's when we preach, we teach, we give testimony, we share the gospel, we share the Word of God. Those are forms of spreading the seed, uh, spreading the word. And so you, as the sower, you go to sleep, you, you rise up daily, you, you do whatever you, whatever you do, but you find that the seed sprouts many times on its own and grows by itself. You see the blade, you see the ear, you see the full grain. Um, so it's kind of a process. You know, we see that, and, and we know that in our lives, as we talked about the sanctification process, the, the things we talked about at the beginning, um, our, our lives are to progress as Christians as we continue to grow and put our trust in the Lord. And in the midst of that, in verse 27 and 28, the beginning, let's see, not 20, yeah, 27 and 28, um, towards the end of 27 and the first part of 28, I think is the key to this, to this parable. The seed sprouts and grows, and you do not know how. God knows how. God knows how. You know, it's, it's, this, it's this miracle that, that happens. The earth produces by itself many times. There's spontaneous growth. Um, the seed sprouts and grows, and we don't know how. What lessons do we learn from that? I think the first thing is we, we recognize we have our part. Our part is to plant the seed so we do what we can do. God's part is to grow the seed and he does only what he can do. We can't, we can't make it grow. We can give forth the seed and, and hopefully we give it in a way that is true and right with the right kind of spirit, the right kind of attitude that someone who is receptive and the spirit is speaking to can receive that and think about it 
and, and recognize it as truth. What, what, what they do with it, it's not up to us. Ours is only to give it forth. So we do our part. We plant a seed. God does his part. He grows the seed. And only he can do that by his spirit. It reminds me of Isaiah 55, 11. God's word goes out from his mouth. It shall not return empty, but will accomplish what God purposes. So God is sovereign. And I think this is a part of what the lesson is here in this particular parable. God is sovereign, yet he calls us to be his fellow workers. You know, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9 says that. We are partners with him in the harvest, but he is Lord of all. Uh, Paul says he plants, Apollos, Apollos waters, but God gives the growth. Uh, so, you know, it's growth in both our Christian walk and even growth that unbelievers can experience as the seed continues to be planted in their lives, that they can respond more and more potentially to the, the calling and the conviction of the Holy Spirit so that they, they will grow to the point where they realize that they need Jesus. So it's kind of an interesting parable because um, it's reminding us, um, you know, what, what, what God does and, and what, we, what we do. But it's reminding us that God is, God is sovereign. He, he is over all. And he ultimately is the one who brings forth the, the growth and the fruit in, in, the, in the lives of people. So any, any thoughts on that? Any? Uh, Nancy? I was thinking, you know, going back to the parable of the four soils, mm. we don't know who has a callous heart or a casual or a thorny ha mm. heart. Only God knows what's in their hearts. So mm -hmm. our part, which you already said, what, is to just scatter the seed to whomever we come into contact with, and then he produces in those who have the good soil. Yeah. Yeah. Or he We, we scatter the seed, but he, they, he is the one that makes them uh, be able to receive it. You know, if, yeah. if, if, if they're open to, to listen, lo the Lord is going to change them and transform them. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Okay, so that takes us to the next parable, and it's called the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the, the weeds. And that's found in Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. And then the explanation of it is in Matthew 13, 36 to 43. So I want to skip over the mustard seed and the leaven to do that at the end. So we can do this together, read the parable, and then talk about how, the, how it's interpreted. So who would like to read Matthew 13, 24 to 30? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay. So if you were to summarize what this is about, reading that, what period of time is this referring to? Uh, what, what, what do you see this as being about? Got some, got some chuckles over here, so you, you were thinking something. 
It can be about any time. Like right now, we can look and see that the good people or the lovers of God are the um, wheat and the tares are the evil people in this world. Okay. All right. Isa, do you want to say anything? Okay. Anyone else? Gathering of the, uh, um, you know, taking apart the uh, the weed, the what is it called? <laughs> the weed and the tears. Weeds and tears, yeah. The weeds. The weeds and then bind them in bundles and burned, but gather the wheat into my barn, which kind of talks mostly, possibly bringing in the believers together, uh, who are saved, you know, something in that direction. Okay, so at the at the end of it, let's see. It talks about the harvest time, okay? Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So, well, we'll, we'll see as, as it goes to the interpretation, but let's this, just this, this look at this a little bit more. As I said, this is only found in Matthew, um, and it does give an interpretation a little bit later, and we'll look at it in, in a, a few minutes. So Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a man who sows good seed in his field. And while he's asleep, it's in interesting, both of these, these two parables talk about the sower sleeping <laughs> at some point, because we're going to sleep, you know. Y you don't sow seed and right away it takes root. So, so while he's asleep, the enemy comes and sows weeds among the wheat. When the wheat grew, so did the weeds side by side. And a ma the master says, an enemy did this. Now the servants want to gather up the seeds, or, or gather up the weeds, excuse me. Um, and the master says, no, don't pull up the weeds because you may pull up wheat with them before it's harvest time. So let them both grow together till the harvest, then the reapers can gather the weeds first, bind them to be burned, and then gather the wheat into my barn. Now, one of the things I learned in doing a little study on this is this, what the tear is like, uh, the, the, the weed. Uh, it, it's, it's suggested it's probably a weed called darnel. Have you ever heard of that? D-A-R-N-E-L. Because the thing about that weed is it looks exactly like wheat growing. For one exception, the, uh, the Darnell ears stand straight up when they, when they grow, when it gets to the ear uh, of, of, the, of the wheat, whatever it is, the grain, yeah. And the ears of the uh, real wheat droops. So, it's interesting. Pride, humility, right? <laughs> and, yeah, the, the, the real wheat, you know, could represent humility, uh, gra graciousness for what God has done, but the weeds, look at me, you know? <laughs> so I just, just, found, just found that interesting. And I think if we really want to understand more fully what it means, Let's go right to the interpretation. And that's in Matthew 13, verses 36 to 43. So who would like to read that? Karen? Okay. 36 to 43. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tears of the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, 
and all will cast and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay. Does that change your opinion of what this is talking about? Okay. We could look, we could look at a, in, a, in a certain way, like what you said before, Karen. At whatever point in time in history, like right now, we could say this is a certain kind of age, so to speak. But the angels aren't coming at this time to, as far as we know, not at this moment anyhow, to uh, take the unbelievers and cast them into the fiery furnace. So the end of the age is the end of time. The end of, you know, after the tribulation, when Jesus comes back again, when he fights his final battle, which is a very, very brief battle. Uh, he's the only one that has a weapon, uh, by the way. I don't, it's, it's his mouth, the sword of his mouth. Yeah, now, we're talking about Revelation 19 uh, at that point. But, um, so, so anyhow, so that's, so that's what it's pointing to, and that's why it talks about how you, you don't separate the wheat from the tares. Because if you think about it, you know, in, in our evangelical churches, uh, we can have tares among us. And on one hand, uh, that's not necessarily going to manifest itself immediately, but over time, it probably will. And that's where we have church discipline. You know, every, every church should have some biblical policy of church discipline. And, and we, we would follow, we should follow Matthew chapter 18. And Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Um, and if you look at our, our constitution and bylaws for the church, you'll see that we have that uh, in there of how you handle, uh, how you handle discipline situations. Um, you only can do that with members. You can't do that with someone who's just attending. You might ask them to leave if they're causing problems. But what I'm saying is, obviously, as we're living right now, as we're you know, living within the confines of a church fellowship and the body of Christ and how we relate to one another. If there are moral, theological, uh, other issues that are of a, such a nature that they need to be confronted, you don't wait until the, you don't wait until the end of the age to, to deal with that. This is talking about the end of time, going 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 down through through time to to the to the end. Um, and, and it is true that you can, by trying to deal with certain people, you can also hurt other people. Uh, and, and often this will happen in a church discipline situation. Have you, any of you been in a situation like that in a church? What, what, what happens, do you think, whenever, whenever you have to say that this person is no longer part of the church because of, of their behavior? Split. Split. Almost always. I had I had a situation. It wasn't it wasn't true to a, a church discipline situation like like we're talking about here. But the, the three churches ago, I was at an inner city church in New Jersey, and we had this situation. I might have mentioned this before, but I'm just using it to illustrate what we're talking about right now. How that we had to uh, I, I had to deal with something with with someone in the church that wanted to be an elder and had been an elder previously on a number of occasions, had gone through four or three divorces and uh, was on his fourth marriage. And, you know, he, he made the decision, okay, I'm an elder now. Okay, I got divorced. I'm not going to be an elder for a while. Then he got remarried. And then he told everybody, I'm ready to be an elder again. And they made him an elder. And this happened four times. And when it came up, I, I just stood, I, I stood against it, and I said, I don't, I don't believe this is the right way to do it. If, if an elder has to be the, elder, uh, the husband of one wife, then, you know, that doesn't seem to be a person that we should have as an elder. It's not to judge the person in their Christian life on, on the whole. It's just in this particular area. And so anyhow, when I left, uh, there was a split. I think we had about 80 people at the time and about 40 people left and 40 stayed. And two years later, the church closed. 
uh, because of this one person who became dictato dictatorial in that fellowship. Uh, fortunately, there was a Spanish church that was using the facilities on sa Sunday afternoon and Friday evenings for prayer service, and they have the whole building, so it's not a whole loss, but it's kind of a sad, sad thing. Yes, Sam. Do you think that God right now is separating the wheat from the shaft? Some churches are coming out blatantly uh, yeah. being apostate, false yeah. teaching, uh, yeah. whether it's homosexuality, trans... Transgender, whatever, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. and and we're we're recognizing those, and it seems like they're starting to separate the, the true Bible teaching churches as opposed to name it and claim it, blabber and grab it, and all that stuff. Oh, it's all common health, well, and all that stuff. I never heard nab it and grab it. That's pretty yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's true. You know, God. God God can do the separating. We, we, have a, we have a harder time. But again, if we, if we have these situations that we, we know of, we're to go to that person and talk to them about it. They refuse to repent. We take a couple other people's people, uh, hopefully the elders, and to deal with that situation. If they still don't repent, then it says you bring it before the whole church. I've never seen it where it came before the whole church, but I've heard of churches that talk about what that's like. So-and-so has refused to repent of a situation. Um, you know, they've been removed from the church. Pray for them. Pray that they'll be restored. Because you know, it says you treat them like an unbeliever. Well, how do you treat an unbeliever? You treat them with love still. <laughs> you, you, you still pray for them. You still ask God to, uh, to soften their heart to him and, and to repent and to come to Christ. Yes, dear, did you have something? Well, I, I had a comment about the reapers because in Revelation 14, it talks about the reapers. Yeah, I'm gonna talk about Revelation are. 14 too. Oh, okay. But that's okay, you can, you can mention it now. Oh, okay. It's good. Well, Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. Yep. <laughs> It says, uh, I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And then they verse fell nineteen the fire and so on. Did you go down to verse nineteen? Okay, verse nineteen says, "So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of God." Yeah. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so I was going to bring that out, Revelation. Uh, 14 and 19. Uh, well, uh, oh yeah, this is a prophecy. Yeah, yeah. Very, yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah I, I, li I, I liked what Stanley said last week. You know, parables are supposed to uh, give a simple, simple way of saying something, but they tend to obscure. They tend to obscure the truth because even the disciples had to ask what the sower and the soils meant and what this parable meant. I'm surprised they knew what the other ones meant because I don't know what they mean, <laughs> as you'll see later. Uh, I got two interpretations for each of the other two. San Stanley, you were going to say something. Nancy. Nancy. You know, the only thing I was just saying is that, yeah, contextually, this is, looks like a prophecy of the end of times and, right. you know, tribulation and end of time when Christ comes back and, and the return happens. But yeah, it, like to Sam's point, sometimes we can take it as an application to some extent, but yep. but, but, but the application doesn't mean that's what the meaning is. Right. That, so we, we just need to always differentiate the two. Uh, and I think that's what me and Pastor David were talking earlier yep. this week, that yep. there is a passage, what it truly means, but then we can also apply because there is a lot of false teaching all across, and those are the tears which yep. are happening all across churches. Right. So right. we need to be cognizant of that and be uh, kind of deal with it appropriately. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so who wants to read the interpretation? Matthew 13, 36 to 43. Since I have the mic, I'll do it. You got the mic. Go on. Then he left the crowds and went into the 
Did you say Matthew 13? Yeah, so you're, you're right. To, okay, yeah. I thought we already read that. Oh, we, we read that? Yeah. Yeah, Adam read it. That's right, you did. I'm sorry. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So it's just the way I have my notes here. That, so in my, in my notes, after we talked about the, the wheat and the tares, the parable itself, before the explanation, I say, you don't have to wonder what it means. Jesus explained it to his disciples in verses 36 to 43. The sower of the good seed is who? Who sows the good seed? Jesus, the Son of Man. And I'm sure that we can say that that's what we, that we do too. Uh, but it says the Son of Man. Who is the field? The world. Who, what is the good seed? Sons of the kingdom. And, and who are the weeds? The evil ones. Sons of the evil ones. Who's the enemy who sows the seed? The devil. devil. When, when is the harvest? It's the end of the age, the end times, the second coming. Who are the reapers? Okay, so there you go. That's what it, that's what it means. <laughs> so at the end of the age, Jesus will send his angels to gather sinners and lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. So do you have any doubts what he's referring to there? What do we call that place? Hell. The lake of fire. Okay. I have so, a question. Yes, go ahead. So this kind of pops me. I mean, I've heard this before, but I thought let's just talk about it. So this is talking about the angels coming as being reapers. Yeah. So when believers die, do you feel that angels come and receive them? I don't know. I've, you know, you, you hear of... You hear people who come come back, not having died fully, and they sometimes talked about an angel or something or, or whatever. I, I I don't know. I do you have a you well, have a scripture, Nancy? Yeah. I don't want conjecture here. In Luke, <laughs> in, I think it's in Luke. Jesus oh, talks about angel. Lazarus and the rich man, and he said the angels came and got Lazarus and there took him into Abraham's bosom. So yeah. I think Jesus was saying by that that yes, the angels come and take uh, the believers to ha to. You know, we don't know where that he takes them. It's well, says Abraham's bosom. Yeah, that's. But it says now in the New Testament to be absent from the body is to be present with the right. Lord. So prior to Christ's resurrection, there was a place called Sheol where the dead went. I, I guess maybe that's part of where Catholics get the idea of purgatory. I don't know. But because. If we follow the parable, it says it to the reapers, which are the angels. First gather together the tares and bind them bundles to a. Uh, to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So it's both ways, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously, at the end of Revelation, before the millennium, and before the great white throne and all of that stuff, there is the coming of Jesus, and he's going to fight the battle of Armageddon and, and set up his kingdom. And... He's going to be destroying uh, those who are of the devil, of you know the the beast and the false prophet are mentioned in Revelation 19. Um, they're throwing thrown into the lake of fire, etc. And those who have taken the mark of the beast also with them. So um, yeah, and the parable of uh, rich man and Lazarus is in Luke's chapter 16, where Nancy was referring to. Okay, so. So we got all those different understandings of these things. So again, this is a f picture of the final judgment of sinners at the end of the age who are relegated to hell. Now it refers to it as a fiery furnace. Um, here in Matthew 13, verse 42, and also in Matthew 13, verse 50, um, hell is referred to as a fiery furnace. Uh, it also says in uh, three other passages in Matthew, it's interesting, Matthew is the only one that seems to talk about hell in this way, as a fiery furnace, as outer darkness, and um, as, you know, about the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, 
I think weeping and gnashing of teeth is also found in Mark and Luke. But, but anyway, um, three times in Matthew, he refers to hell as outer darkness. Jesus does. And then it talks about weeping. There's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And all five of these verses refer to how there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we can imagine that uh, in a place like, like hell. So, so this is what it's talking about. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, okay, so Nancy, Nancy talked about Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15, and then also 19. And this points towards Christ's second coming at the end of the age, and in verse 19, the judgment of God's wrath. And the judgment of God's wrath has to do with what Jesus is talking about here in this parable at the end of the age. Um, Revelation 19, 11 to 21 gives a fuller picture of Christ's second coming. Oh, excuse me. You know, I was talking about Revelation 14 before. Um, this is what Nancy was reading. Then, then you come to Revelation 19, 11 to 21 that gives the fuller picture of Christ's second coming and his conquest and judgment of unbelievers in what he calls the great supper of God along with the beast and the false prophets. Um, let, me, let me just mention this. I don't, don't want to sound controversial if you haven't thought of this before, but as I, as I have studied Revelation over the years, I have come to not totally see it as chronological. I see it as kind of layered. In Revelation 14, seems to be talking about the second coming of Christ at the, end of, at the end of the tribulation. And Revelation 19 is definitely talking about that. And, and so what, what, I would, what I would see is that Revelation 14 is giving us, pointing towards the actual second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation. Okay, um, so you bring them both together and you get a fuller picture of what, of what that's going to look like in the end time. So, so that, that's where I'm, I'm coming from on showing the, you both of those passages as well. So in the parable, Jesus tells us, his, tells us, his servants, to live side by side with unbelievers who look and act like us. And again, as we apply this to our lives now, we're to be in the world but not of the world, right? Uh, John 17, Jesus Praise not that we be taken out of the world, but that we be kept from the evil and the evil one. So, you know, application-wise, you know, we recognize that, that though we live in the world, we're not to be worldly or of the world. But ultimately, this passage is prophetic, as you said, and is looking to the end time uh, of when judgment is going to come uh, at least the first part of judgment is going to come on, on the unbeliever and, and the separation between the believers and the unbelievers in, in that time. So the parable explanation ends by saying the righteous, the believers, will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And, and that's where it's, you know, looking at both. Not only what's going to happen to the unbeliever, but for the believer, we're going to, we're going to shine like the sun. You know, we're and, and, and we should be doing that right now, you know. Um, l let people see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Uh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, I thought you said something, Sharon. Okay. <laughs> I was excited. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, that's how we're supposed to be living now. Um, and, and many times, if we understand it, the more there is darkness the more we should be able to show our light. You know, you, sh you shine a flashlight that's maybe low on batteries into the darkness, it's still gonna illuminate pretty good. And, and we're like that, we're like that flashlight. We're, we are the light of the world, as Jesus is the ultimate light of the world. Um, and so, you know, it just reminds us of, of what's going to be taking place in the future. Um, so, any other thoughts on that? Okay, so we go backwards a little bit to Matthew 13, 
31 and 32, the parable of the mustard seed, and, and then after that, the parable of the leaven. So, you got it? Okay, Nance. Re- read both. Uh, read uh, 31 to 33. Okay. Matthew 13, 31 to 33. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Okay, so do you do you look at these two parables as kind of like saying the same thing? Do you you see the similarity between them? Okay, and what would that be? What, What do you what do you see in this parable? Anybody? Nancy, be glad to give you the mic. <laughs> I see um, that the least, right? The the it, um, he's, he's saying, look at the mustard seed, right? The, 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 it was the, the, the least, and how how big it can it can grow. It break, it's greater than herbs and everything else. So it's kind of like saying. Uh, it doesn't matter how small, right? If the, it, 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 the Lord can make it uh, work uh, its way yeah. for His purpose, right? In, mm-hmm. in, in, so that the birds in the air can come to the net, to, to the nest and, and, and rest. Okay. Uh, and the leaven, it's kind of the same thing. The leaven is something that it needs to time for it to grow, yeah. and, and and it prepares lots of meals for everybody. Okay. Okay. Were you gonna say similar? Okay. All right, so unfortunately, there are two schools of thought on this, and there shouldn't be two schools of thought, because Jesus is supposed to be giving parables that are to explain um, how things are or how things will be, and uh, I have very great respect for both sides of this. (laughs) I hate to say that because I don't want to be (laughs) two-sided or not take a stand, but there are two, two ways that this is, is looked at. Um, let's look at the parable of the mustard seed, okay? As E.C. said, this, you know, the mustard seed is, is talked about in faith in the past. If you have faith as small as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed, and it will be removed. And, and here we see this mustard seed that grows into not just a bush, but a tree. I call it the tree bush. We, we had one of those at our house. Is that okay if I say that, Nancy? Nancy planted some little teensy little thing in the front of our yard 20 years ago. I'm telling you, this little. And that thing sprouted. It had like three trunks to it. And, and 15 feet high, 18 feet high, until we cut it down, finally, soon before we moved away. But <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. So I kind of have a picture of, of this kind of thing. That, it, that Jesus is talking about. Um, and so the mustard seed grows and becomes this huge bush tree, and it says the birds of the air make their nests in the branches. Okay, so the first interpretation is, is what E.C. said. Do I say that right? E.C.? Okay. I'm always a little bit unsure, so, okay. So it's believed by a lot of people, and by Isi, and maybe you, that this refers to the universal church throughout the world. Just like the kingdom of God, it has explosive growth, miraculous growth. Uh, no, No mustard bush known to man has ever grown like this. You could say that the church of Jesus Christ is like no other institution, or like no other group of people. And so people like, you know, these are some, some commentators I, I look to. John Monroe Gibson, you probably never heard of. George Chadwick, you might have. Adam Clark, you probably heard of. David Jeremiah and John MacArthur. 
Their main point is how from very small beginnings, the, the gospel, has, gospel has pervaded into people's hearts all over the world, and the church has grown in leaps and bounds. Zechariah 4, verse 10, despise not the day of small things. Wonderful verse. And so the other viewpoint, believe it or not, says that this refers to the false church, the ecumenical church, the one world church that we keep reading about in, in the scripture. Those tares that we talk about that are within the true church, that, that this is what it's talking about. And the corruption, the corruption of the, the true church the counterfeit, because a mustard seed has never grown like this before. So they're looking at it in the negative sense of how the mustard seed has grown into this monstrous thing, okay? Um, it grows unnaturally from a bush into a tree. Mustard seed doesn't do that. The context of this parable is between the parable of the weeds and the parable of the leaven, and the leaven, okay, I, I, I looked it up, 32 times leaven is mentioned in the Bible. How many times do you think it was used in a positive way? Three, if you count this. Two other times it, it is used positively. Every other time it talks about unleavened bread and negatively about leavened bread. Also, what did we learn from the parable of the sower and the soils? about the birds. It says, if you don't understand this parable, you won't understand all the parables. So if you apply that to this, who do the birds represent? The devil, the evil one. They're in those branches. <laughs> they're, they're all throughout. The, the, the true church is being invaded by the false church. The other thing is, it says, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is like. You know, the parable of the sower and the soils, the parable of the wheat and the tares, and the parable of the um, seed that grows on its own. It, it doesn't preface it with that. It just goes right into what, what it is. So when it, something is like something, it could be the same as, or it could be false, counterfeit. It's like it, but it's not really it. So there's a number of people who also uh, view it that way. Um, G. Campbell Morgan, which is probably, f probably familiar. R.A. Carson is a theologian of uh, recent days. William Barclay has been, had been around a long time. Ray Stedman, my buddy that I talked about before. And David Guzik, whom I have um, referred to on a number of occasions in this class. And in my defense, Lindsay has quoted him on many occasions as well. So, so I, I, can, I can see both things. The thi I guess the thing that, on the second one, the thing that kind of bothers me is the, is the idea that, I, I, like, I like the idea that about the church, though being small, starting out small in such small beginnings, humble beginnings, has grown to reach, to reach the whole world, most of the world anyhow. Um, but then you look at, like I said, you look at leaven, with how it's usually used, although mustard seed is usually used in a good way, so that kind of cancels out. So I just leave you with both those. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what, you know, I, I, w I wish Jesus had gone and give the interpretation like he did for the sower and the soils and the wheat and the tares, and we'd know exactly. And so the, the parable of the leaven in the same sense, has the two interpretations, like the mustard seed. Um, obviously, there's nothing wrong with bread being leavened, and, and you know we do that all the time. Bread is the staff of life. Um, this batch was so big it could feed 100 people, which is kind of unnatural, too. Um, the uh, same commentators who believed um, that this is something that's a good thing, and the same commentators that believe that the mustard seed was a bad thing, they agree on this one too. So they, they see them as two parables that talk about the same, same concept. Yes, dear? Well, 
in the, the leaven one, it says the kingdom of God is like leaven, which a woman took and hid. Yeah, that's the other one. The, the idea of hiding something. Right. It reminded me of how the tares were sown. They're like hidden in right. the field there. Yeah. And, and yeah. they grow together. Yeah, that was, the, uh, that was the other word that was in there, that it was hidden in, in, the, in, in the measure of flour. So... Uh, G. Campbell Morgan makes a statement on the, the leaven that the leaven here represents pagan influences brought into the church. So I, I wish I could have been more definitive on this, but I, I couldn't, I can't really say. I, I've kind of over time leaned toward the second view, but I don't know. And I, I'm not going to stand here and tell you definitively it's it's this way or it's that way. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess that could be too. Yeah. So it's it's interesting because I, I have a lot of respect for a lot of these people on both sides as far as how they, how they understand scripture. And uh, they've been helpful to me in my understanding of certain things over the, over the course of 50 years of, of ministry. So, um, so I leave you on that limp-wristed note, <laughs> you might say. And uh, so next week, we're just gonna do three parables. There's only about 10 verses, I think, of, the, of those parables. And again, they don't give the interpretation either. So uh, pray for me that I'll, I'll be more hopefully definitive in the Lord, not just in my thinking, but in the Lord's thinking about what those are. Okay, so we're going to close. Go, go ahead, you can turn it off and I'll just pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for each one here and for the Rashids who are out greeting people now, Lord. Use them to be a blessing to others as they were a blessing to us the first time we came. And Lord, I just uh, thank you for this service. We pray that you'll uh, be with Brother Stanley as he preaches, that you would fill him with your spirit and that we would hear what you want us to hear and that we would truly worship you uh, in this day. And thank you for all that you will do in Jesus' name.